Okay, so uh, Hans is, uh, as I said before, we will have some lightnings, and Hans is not going to speak about love, but about kiss and uh, some good practice <laughs> for development. There we are. So this is a short, basically what I'm doing here in this presentation. I've been programming for about 30 years, ever since I got my first uh, ZX, no, ZX81, little tiny 8-bit computer. And I'm basically, this presentation is about what I learned about programming, and I do it in 20 minutes. Which might mean that I'm a really crappy programmer. Uh, I leave it up to you. But it's basically all about the things that I learned, how things work, what you should do, what keeps you sane. Um, roughly three sections. The first one is a little bit about design and implementation. The next one is about the KISS principle. Keep things, uh, keep it uh, simple. Uh, sorry, keep it short, stupid. And the last one is just sanity rules. Guidelines only. Uh, my own opinion, if you get promoted by following these guidelines, then uh, I take the credits. If you get fired, then it has nothing to do with me. <laughs> First rule, do as little as possible. Every time you touch the keyboard, you start introducing bugs. <laughs> so, as far as I'm concerned, the best way, the, the, the best program you can make is no program at all. I mean, that one will work. Uh, it's, everybody laughs, but I see piles and piles and piles of code being produced by people who seem to do nothing else but sort of stream of consciousness programming, typing and typing and typing, and it is a pile of crap. Uh, so design guidelines, uh, basically, what is, what is programming? It's research and development. It's not production. Production is doing a copy of the source. That's production. That's easy. Everything you do as a programmer is research. So when you start out with a new project, a new feature, whatever you want to do, you're, you start out with a design, either on paper or in your head. But since you haven't done anything yet, you can't do much more than a very rough outline. Programming is basically all about learning. While you're programming, you're learning about the problem, you're learning about what works and what doesn't work. And it, what doesn't, definitely does not work is trying to do an upfront design into the to my tiniest details because it's guaranteed wrong. Um, the way I work, I have a problem. I need to write something, fix it, write, write code for it. First thing I always do is what is the most risky part of what I need to do? What is the most uncertain part? And that is where I concentrate my initial efforts. Uh, because as long as I don't know whether the problem can even be solved uh, or even how to do it or whatever, you know, you can't give any estimates to managers. There are always managers involved. Uh, they like numbers. So step one is what is risky. And what is risky for one person is trivial for another. So it depends on your, uh, your experience level. And you're free to ask colleagues who are more experienced to say, is this possible? How would I do this? Can you help me? But the guideline is start with the high risk parts. Don't do all the simple parts and then you get at the end of the project, you have to do the hard parts and then you realize, oh my God, this takes another year of work. You have to identify that in the beginning. And, uh, oh, one too far. And try to plan 
So you, you typically can't plan your whole project because there are high risk parts that you don't know. But quite often you can plan roughly how much time it will take you to figure out those high risk parts. So your first estimate can say, well, come back in two weeks, I should know how long this project will take. Keeps managers happy. So implementation guidelines, uh, I really like what has turned out to be called evolutionary prototyping. I never knew that, I just did it like that, which is basically you, you code with the purpose of getting a, a good program at the end, but you're allowed to go back to your code and rework it when you realize, hey, this is shit, wrong design. I don't like personally the idea of really making a complete prototype and then throwing it away. I think that's a waste of time. If you do it smart, you just work on it and improve it. The important part is that you have to go back. You have to allow yourself to rewrite your code that you know is bad and that can be done much better. And the nice thing about evolutionary prototyping is also that you almost always have something that works. It may not be perfect, but you can test something. You, you may be able just to have a command line tool that will exercise it and you get a zero or a one back. That's good enough. You can test your code. That's the essential. Writing piles of code without being able to test is sort of like dry swimming on the land and then be thrown into the water and then you sink. Uh, so coding is learning and you have this whole cycle of designing and coding and learning and going back to your design, etc. It's just important to realize it. Uh, the other thing is layers. It's a bit of an art. Uh, too many layers is just very difficult to debug, debug and understand and everything. Too few layers and that basically the same thing and then you get Basic idea is if you have too many layers, you get all those little functions that call other functions. That's the only thing they do. If you don't have enough layers, you get these huge functions that do everything and the kitchen sink and you can't understand. And you need to figure out, it's, it's a learning curve as a programmer, it's experience, what is the right number of layers. I'm, the more I learn about programming, uh, the more I hate too many layers, particularly. It's very hard to debug, very hard to follow the control flow through a program. Lean and mean, sounds simple. Nobody ever does it. Just code what you need, not what you might need tomorrow or next year or what some competitor is doing. No, you're, you're getting a task, do that. The only thing you need to pay attention to is that you don't write yourself into a corner and that you can't extend it in the future. Um, finally, it's your responsibility to let your project lead or team leader or whatever it's called, Greg, uh, when you realize, oh, this takes much longer than I expected, they need to know because then they can take corrective actions. If your manager is the type of uh, shoot the messenger, then I recommend transferring internally or getting another job because, frankly, a manager like that's not worth uh, your uh, heartache uh, when you have to deal with that. But on the other hand, what you, as a manager, you don't want to hear someone, you know, you one day before it should be released and, hey, oh, sorry, man, it um, takes another month. It's too late to take any action. Not good. So my four lines of classifying code. Absent code, that's great. You have to write it. That's where how you earn your paycheck. Working code, someone else earned a paycheck. Excellent. Buggy code, well, someone else did a bad job. But hey, you can earn money by fixing that shit. And besides, uh, let's, let's be honest. Buggy code is, uh, is our own conspiracy. If you wrote everything perfectly, we would be out of a job. <laughs> so, we are, I think we're doing pretty good as a software engineering community in keeping ourselves in jobs. <laughs> Keep doing that, guys. Uh, but the one I really truly hate is that code. I hate that code. So you have this code and it looks to be unused, but why is it there? And is this code that should have been called? So it's a bug. Is this code that really can be removed? But are we sure that it's not used in some magical linker weird stuff somewhere else? Uh, you often, I've been in that situation several times and I hated it. Quite often the guy that actually wrote the code has gone, unreachable, so you're, you're just thinking, what the hell do I do with this? Um, based on my experience, 
I would basically say just remove it, and if someone starts yelling, then <laughs> put it back. But then add some comments on how it's used and stuff like that. It's really difficult to see what is going on. Contrary to the other three, you know what's happening there. But with that code, what does it do? Um, some guidelines. So everybody knows, keep it simple, keep, uh, keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple, I, I hate that saying. Keeping it simple is very, very hard. I would say keep it short. That's much easier. Nice quote. Basically, you know, keeping, keeping things short, that is a lot easier to do. And quite often, what happens is that if you make things short, it is usually the first step towards simplicity. If nothing else, you start detecting which parts of your program are too complex, because you usually can't make it short very easily. You have to rewrite it. And so it, it, and it's amazing that you see the weirdest stuff some, that people write that where you think this can be done much, much shorter. So some examples, they're all over the place. This one is, I think, originally from a staging driver. It's a huge function that does nothing, almost nothing. So this went from 32 lines to 13. Uh, regarding, I'm disregarding all the camel case and stuff like that. I mean, this was a staging driver, so it's allowed. But, I mean, really, how, how, which self-respecting programmer can ever write crap like that? Come on. Terrible. Uh, another one. Uh, actually, there are 19 lines of comments uh, removed that were before this, uh, this function. Uh, what it really does is a one-liner. <laughs> this is real code. I mean, I, I didn't make that up. This is real stuff that I've seen. And I'm just thinking, how, how it just takes a lot of time to do that. I mean, it's not trivial. It, it takes effort to write stuff like that. <laughs> Have you nothing better to do? No family to go home to? Uh, play a nice video game or whatever? <laughs> Uh, the other thing, spacing, everybody always complains about, yeah, why, why do I have to add this space here? Come on, I can read it. That's not the pro I know you can read it. I can't read it. I'm the poor thought who has to review it. And basically, so this is, I, mean, I don't understand the problem, because the, for a large part, the coding style rules in the kernel are pretty much the same as normal English or French or any uh, Roman-based alphabet. It's nothing special about it. You learned it in, in, at school, how to, where you add spaces and new lines and paragraphs and stuff like that. And basically, code is just the same. So, you know, which of the two is harder to read? Well, I'm hoping everybody will agree it's the first one. Uh, if I see code that doesn't follow the coding style, I will reject it for the simple reason that it takes me twice as long to review. I have better things to do with my life. Uh, some simple examples where I just clean it up. <clears throat> the, the weird thing that I never can understand. So, okay, you don't want to add a space after the if. Well, I disagree, but okay. But why do you have a space before the step with your alpha? At least do it consistently. I, it, <laughs> Why? Uh, ridiculous comments. <laughs> I didn't make this up. I, I, there are some X's there where I hit, <laughs> hit the person responsible. Uh, this was code we got from another company years ago. Uh, I wasn't working with Linux at the time. But you mean, really, who cares what tools you are using? The source, it's C. Yeah. <laughs> what a surprise. Um, another simple, simple thing, you have functions that always return the same value, true or false or whatever, or zero. Replace, if they always re return the same value, replace it with void. Because quite often there are other functions that aren't aware that it just always returns the same value. They do the same check over and over again. By replacing that with a void function, you often can get rid of a whole chain of complexity. Very nice uh, trick to do. 
Um, one thing that I, I actually never seen any book or coding style guide mention this, but I find it very useful. So you have a function and you have a condition and then you have a long piece of code. And then there is an else and there's a short piece of code. Turn it around. If not condition, short code, return, and then the long code. For one thing, the long code will all be indented uh, to the left, so it makes it a bit easier to read. More importantly, for me as a reviewer, usually the short codes are corner cases. So if I'm reviewing the function, I'm seeing, okay, this is the null pointer check, great, so that's done. This is an empty list, great, that's done. Okay, now I get into the meat of the code. So I see immediately that whoever wrote it paid attention and did the corner cases. And it looks much better than you know having everything shifted to the extra tab, especially with the one, one thing in the coding style I don't agree with, which is the eight uh, space tab. I think it's really long. Anyway. Uh, I would like to add something. Uh, most often, this short code is error processing, and it's very common that we can simply copy past it between multiple functions which have to perform the exact same test. Uh, so it's very really important, in my opinion, to keep uh, this short code uh, the way you, uh, you wrote it uh, in your example. Because when you want to perform some error uh, check, uh, uh, some consistency check, I mean, before the long code, it's better sometimes to pick a copy of uh, something which already works somewhere yeah. instead yeah. of uh, risking to uh, return the condition. Uh, so same trick for a for loop, if not condition, short code, continue, and then the long one. Uh, personal pet peeve, um, if condition, return one, and then you get else. The else indicates for me that there is some way to get out of the if without going through the return. So don't write else. It's, it signals something different for me. Uh, didn't someone add it to check patch? Yeah. I think it was recently added, so that's good, excellent. Uh, debugging code, you're writing code, and you're, you know, when you're developing, you want debug code, great. But for Christ's sake, all the trivial stuff, remove it. It's, I mean, this is a one-liner function, and there's three extra lines of debugging. Get lost. Um, oh, C++, we are kernel hackers. We don't do, do no bleeding C++, so I'm skipping that one. <laughs> It's a lightning talk. Uh, const, you know, if, if it's relevant, use it. It's very good. The kernel will warn you if you try to modify stuff, so. Uh, compile, this, so that's, that's more for non, in the kernel you get this anyway. But if you compile stuff yourself, compile with all the warnings and fix them. If you don't fix them, you won't see what is really valid. You know, if new warnings appear that are important, you won't detect them. Uh, premature optimization, root of all evil, absolutely true. Uh, all too often I see people, you know, in code. I'm co-maintainer of Video for Linux. What is the biggest problem in Video for Linux? It's not performance, it's complexity. Video is complex. Trying to keep things simple and understandable is much more important. There is no performance issue. Video is all DMA. You, you exchange some pointers, set up a DMA engine, and you let it rip. But making things more complex by using the wrong or complicated data structures, um, likely and unlikely for code that is executed once every hour. If you, if you really think you need that red black tree for storing 50 items, you might want to do some performance testing. I did that in the past when I had sort of similar issues. It was really surprising sometimes. Uh, you really need a very long unsorted linked list before uh, your red black tree gets better because the overhead is so much larger. A linked list, man, the CPU goes straight through it very fast. Red black trees, just to add some item, you need to do also the rebalancing, difficult. Uh, and even I, I had some interesting uh, algorithm book that suggested uh, it was a hash tree, so you have a bucket and a list. And then uh, basically he said, well, if you, hit, if you hit a certain item, move it to the front. So the next time you, you do the same item, you, you, you will hit it immediately. And if you have cases in a head, that's where you typically use the same element over and over again for a period. Now, that sounded very nice. 
turned out that it actually slowed the CPU so much just by uh, change moving the elements around that it, that it just made it slower. Sounded great on paper, worked, didn't work out at all on practice. So if you think you need to optimize, you must come with performance measurements. Because you may be very surprised that you don't need it at all. It's, it's very simple. Just show me, do you really think that likely will have any effect? Yeah. No, it... <laughs> yeah. The, the, the only time they make, might, might make sense is in really tiny inner loop that are performed zillions of times, but how many places in the kernel do we have like that? Not many. And even then, I want to see numbers. Yes. So that, that's basically my, my tips. Just keep your code clean, lean, mean, short, and if you're really good, you can even make it simple. But start with just making it short. At, at the very least, me as a reviewer, I don't have to read so bloody much. So help me out here. Um, lifestyle rules. Yeah. Know yourself. What are you good at? What are you bad at? I'm crap at networking. I'm crap at that data, databases I hate. It's literally, it has been a reason for me to move jobs. <laughs> It's not that I can't do it, I think just it's the most boring topic in the world. Luckily, there are people who really enjoy it. I hate it. I'm not very good at networking. I don't know. I miss the networking bits in my brain, apparently. Uh, so stick to stuff that you're really good at. It doesn't, if you don't know if you're good at it, it's good to try it out. And you, you may discover, hey, I have a talent for this. But if you've learned that, okay, I'm, I'm really bad at this, you know, stick to what you're good at. Um, oh, always a nice question. Who is the best in, in programming in the morning? Let's say 6 to 12. I'm French, sorry, I did it in France. 8 to 2. <laughs> or perhaps 10 to 4, I'm not sure. Let's, let's say 10 to 2. So, morning people. Two to, uh, what is it, two to eight? It's going to be interesting. Eight to two a.m.? <laughs> wow, two a.m. to eight a.m.? <laughs> have, have you checked your teeth lately? Uh, Stirred for blood? Anyway, the point is, after a while, you know when you are at your best. So do the difficult stuff when you're at your best. And if you're not, start doing, I don't know, administration, simple tasks. All too often, I'm, I'm not so good after about 4 p.m. My IQ starts to really go down quite drastically. So if I'm trying to find a book and I, it, it's past 4, I just stop. And the next morning, I come in and I find it in 50 minutes. So. You know, don't waste your time. Be effective in that. Um, you learned a lot of new stuff. Well, everybody who has been university or school will know that. You sleep on it the next morning, you understand it a lot better. Same with just standing up, do some pool, foosball, whatever, go to the restroom, get, your, get a little bit of extra blood oxygen into your brain. It will actually help. <coughs> Overtime topic. Any pointy-haired bosses here in the audience? You might want to close your eyes. Um, I hate it, and I think it's terribly ineffective. I see only two reasons why you want to do overtime. One is when there is a real deadline, trade show, that is realistic. So you know with a little bit of extra effort, we can make it for the ready in time. Happens rarely. And then, assuming also that you're paid a decent amount, then I think, okay, that, that's sort of part of your job. So you work for two, 
to perhaps three years, three weeks at the most, you work a little bit harder to get everything ready for the trade show. You know, your boss will appreciate it, your customers will appreciate it. It's good. If it happens infrequently, that's okay. Really, that, that's fair. The other is if you have having fun. You know, every so often I am just working on a project and it's just the vivid driver I presented yesterday. It was a lot of fun doing it. So for a week or two I was doing it, I don't know, ridiculous amount of time was working on it. Well, you're having fun. Nothing wrong with that. Within limits, you know, you have friends, you have family, and if you disappear all the time, then you might get some feedback from them. So it's, you need to, if you do it for two weeks, it's okay. If you're doing it for two months, you might get in problem. And I actually know someone who, who's married, uh, who got a divorce because of stuff like that. So, you're going a bit too far. Uh, structural overtime, absolutely pointless. Uh, there have been studies on that. Your productivity will at best remain the same because you're just spreading it out over the same, over a longer amount of time. But if I, my experience with overtime, I get cranky, I get tired, uh, harder, to, harder to concentrate. I'm just nowhere near as productive. Sorry? Exactly. And if you are forced to do this in your job, then you really need to look for something else. It's not worth uh, your life and heartache and pain that it gives. Uh, what I also don't, I, I've been involved in two, my first job, I've been involved in two overtime projects. I, I, to this day, I don't understand how, why people reacted like they did. So the first one was, okay, we all work an extra Saturday for, I think it was originally six weeks, it became three weeks in the end. And you can get paid extra if we make our goal. I'm sitting there. So you want me to work extra, but I have no guarantee of that extra bonus, overtime bonus? How crazy do you think I am? <laughs> no way. Uh, it turned out I was the only one of two people who complained to the manager about it, and I actually got a different arrangement. I paid student loans, I worked hard, I studied, I, I, I think I do a good job, and you expect me to potentially work for free? I, I have too much pride as a person and programmer for that. Um, and I do not understand why, how many people would have been, on a hundred, why so many just sat there and accepted that? Mystery to me. Uh, the other project was something similar, and but there they were <laughs> were paying a certain amount of money per fixed bug. So you can sort of guess what happens. Every bug got split up in lots of little sub bugs. Uh, uh, we, I was at the time in the system group for that company taking care of sort of base software, and we as a group also went to the manager saying, "Yes, we don't have many bugs, but the bugs that we have are all complicated. It takes us days, one day or more, to fix them." So this whole deal, that's not going to work. We get 50 euro or guilder at a time for fixing a book and working a whole day on it. So we got a different arrangement as well. And again, I, first of all, I don't understand management coming up with a stupid rule. And secondly, really, um, you get in a situation like that, you need to push back. Questions? Everybody agrees? Oh. <laughs> oh, I forgot to say that. It's not an obfuscated C contest. So it must remain readable. <laughs> I, you can make it really, really short and unreadable. It must remain readable, but within that context, it should be short. Yeah, I like it. If it's, uh, you should. <laughs> I will. I'm. I'm use. I have to admit, I use it a lot. I and I would definitely also accept it. If you get really long lines, then you might want to split it up. It's all about readability. What's readable for one person is not to another. Personally, I think 
question mark colon is standard C syntax. You need to understand that. Oh, it differs. I mean, these are guidelines, so if you, I mean, feel free not to use it. <laughs> it's not a problem. It just needs, what I want to avoid is that you get superfluous, crappy code that, that doesn't add anything in any way. <laughs> I think uh, the right answer here is no comments. <laughs> nah, I mean it's it's not it's not so much for me. It's for yourself. It's just no fun. Seriously, it's no fun doing things that you don't like to do. I mean, there must be a better way to earn a living. And besides, you're not good at it, so you probably won't be as productive as well as if you would do, be doing. I'm not, by the way, I'm not talking, you know, everyone in their work sometimes has to do crappy stuff. You know, that's okay. As long as it's lim limited periods, that's fine. But if you really are supposed to do stuff that you hate for a long time, uh, time to change jobs or change something. Yeah, yeah, I mean, readability is paramount. I should have mentioned that, but this was a lightning talk, so I skipped that one. <laughs> readability is paramount, but after that it becomes being short. Not, not stupid, unnecessary stuff. Oh, I, I agree. You need, if you do a project, the kernel has a coding style, and I think most companies have their own coding style. Most projects have a code. You need it because it's important to keep the coding style the same so you can review it easily and everything, everybody can understand the code without getting all confused. It looks just messy if you start mixing coding styles. Everybody wants a drink? Okay, thank you.